So you're an attorney and you've decided to go out on your own. Now what? You need a plan and you're not alone. Join expert host Adriana Linares and her distinguished guests on New Solo. Tune in to the lively conversation as they share insights and information about how to successfully run your law firm here on Legal Talk Network. Hi, and welcome to another episode of New Solo on Legal Talk Network. I'm Adriana Linares, a legal technology trainer and consultant. I help lawyers and law firms use technology better. Before we get started with today's guests and a really fun topic on LinkedIn for lawyers, I want to make sure and thank our sponsors. Thanks to Ross. Ross Intelligence is the legal research platform that leverages AI to get to the heart of legal issues fast. Go to rossintelligence.com for a 14-day free trial. Nexa, formerly known as Answer One, is a leading virtual receptionist and answering service provider for law firms. Learn more by giving them a call at 800-267-9371 or online at nexa.com. Thanks to our sponsor, Clio, and make sure to check out Clio's Daily Matters podcast featuring valuable perspectives on legal in the COVID-19 era. Listen to Daily Matters at clio.com forward slash daily or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Law Clerk is where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Visit lawclerk.legal to learn how to increase your productivity and your profits by working with talented freelance lawyers. Have we ever podcasted together? I don't think we have. Hey, Allison. I don't think so. Hey, Adriana. Thanks for taking the time to to visit with us and talk about your book with Dennis Kennedy, who's our other guest. But before we, uh, you know, put Dennis in the hot seat, tell me a little bit about you, what you do, and where are you? I decided I'm going to start asking my guests that from now on. So I am uh, Allison Shields. I am the president of Legal Ease Consulting. We are located on Long Island in New York, and I help lawyers with the business end of their practice. So everything from productivity all the way through um, marketing and business development and a lot of work with social media and LinkedIn, which is what we'll be talking about today. I didn't know you did social media stuff. Do you do social media for lawyers? Yes. Oh, I'm so glad because I get asked all the time for resources of who does that. And I didn't, I didn't realize you did that. I always thought, I knew you did productivity and of course LinkedIn and um, sort of a business coach. So that's really great to know. Well, I'm glad. Hi, Dennis Kennedy. Hello. I feel like I just saw you. Good to be on the show. Yeah, I think we were at a virtual happy hour just a couple of weeks ago. That's true. Oh, I bet I saw you at tech show. Well, that was eons ago, wasn't it? I guess that it was. Like it was era. before the Rona <laughs> got rid of all the fun in this country. And I still felt we were like one step ahead of the virus in getting out of Chicago. You know, <laughs> like really close to the line. <laughs> that's true. Although apparently I was, you know, in the belly of the beast during Mardi Gras, but that's okay. Thankfully, me and everyone I know, including you guys and your families are healthy. So I'm super happy to hear that. Dennis, you've changed your trajectory a lot over the past year or two. So give us a quick little rundown on your big move to, Ann, are you in Ann Arbor now? I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Okay. And I, I retired from MasterCard where I've been in-house counsel uh, doing information technology. And, and to me, it's innovation law for the last 12 or so years took the chance to do an early retirement. We moved to to Ann Arbor and my wife and daughter talked me into taking a gap year. And now <laughs> I'm doing some some adjunct professoring. I've really gotten involved in in the legal- Vaping and tattoos during that gap, gap year? <laughs> you know, I still think I'm too old for tattoos, but, uh, <laughs> and, and, and you have to make a certain level of commitment. I can do like those, those uh, you know, the silicon wristbands, but the tattoo just seems like- <laughs> Like a bit too much uh, so for me. Unwristband. So I'm, so I'm doing. Close. So I'm getting used to students calling me professor, which is kind of a new thing. And cool. I've written a couple books and do a bunch of uh, online things. And I'm a, you know advise some legal tech companies. And I'm probably going to launch uh, something new that I'm calling the the Kennedy Idea Propulsion Center to satisfy Ooh. my longtime wish to to have my own think tank. I love that. The Kennedy Propulsion Tank? Was that what it was? No, no. Idea Propulsion Center. So if so it's it's modeled after the NASA Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory. That's where I'm at. Yeah. So Kennedy cool. Idea Propulsion Laboratory. And I even have a logo, so I'm I'm pretty committed to it. So I love that. Well I can't wait to hear how that comes along. The perfect time to launch a new business right now. 
Couldn't you know, be it's funny you say that because <laughs> I, I will tell you, I have been thinking I'm going to change my business too, mainly because I have really enjoyed sort of sitting still. Typically um, I fly and I travel a lot and it's kind of weird, but I've really enjoyed it. So I think I'm going to do something a little different too, if I can just find the time to lunch. <laughs> mm -hmm. So for listeners, we are all on Zoom and we can see each other. But I like that because I feel like it makes our conversation a little more intimate and cool. And I love seeing Allison and Dennis. It's We used to get to work together all the time when I was more active with the Law Practice Management Division. They're two, you guys are two of my favorite people. So I appreciate Aww. you taking the time. But I'm really happy to talk about your book, mainly because so many lawyers ask me about LinkedIn. And I have to be the worst social media. And I usually prefer to refer to LinkedIn as business media because it's more business, less social. But I'm definitely one of the worst users of LinkedIn and other social media. So I'm glad to have some experts come on, give us some tips and tricks. So you guys, what edition of the book is this? Well, this is actually, this is a brand new book. So, you know, some of the ideas are things that we've been writing about and talking about for, for years, but we took a little bit of a different twist with this book, which we actually released ourselves. It's a, awesome. It's a, you self-published. Yeah, yep. We did. That's cool. Was that um, just real quick, because I know there's always people interested in learning or figuring out how easy or hard self-publishing a book is. Was that hard, easy? Where's it? Where can I get it? Well, you can get the book on Amazon because we decided to publish direct to Amazon, which makes huh. it, um, and it's in some ways easy. So some of the hard parts remain like actually writing the book, uh, but, <laughs> but we, uh, we found a designer and I think this is key. So we found a designer who did the cover and then did the, all the interior design and put it in the format that was needed for huh. Amazon. And we were really happy with that. And then it's just kind of, you upload the files and Amazon takes over, gives you like the reports you need, puts it up on Amazon. And it's reasonably inexpensive. You know, since with a lot of publishers uh, these days, you end up doing all the marketing yourself as an author. You just kind of like, why, why not get the royalties from Amazon yourself? And, and since you're doing all the marketing anyway, we decided to do it as an experiment, but we like the results. That's really cool. Couple quick questions that I thought of. So did, did you just write it in Word and did you guys have a file that you shared and did it and then you gave the final book to the designer? So the way we, because we've written together for years now, we kind of have a system mm -hmm. set out. So normally the way we do it is we, we work together on a, usually on a shared document to create the outline uh -huh. and the, ch the chapters. And then we usually divide them up so Dennis wrote half of the chapters and I wrote half of the chapters and then we swap. So each one of us then either adds or subtracts oh. or makes edits uh -huh. or whatever to the other person's chapters. Um, and then we usually swap again and, and then go through the whole thing and see if there's any changes that we want to make. And we've found that that works well for us. As a matter of fact, half the time we forget who originally wrote which chapters. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you guys are probably like one brain by now when it comes to some of this. Our writing style is, is really similar, which makes it a lot easier. Probably the biggest difference is I'm more ready to let things go and say, it's done, it's done. And Allison more wants to give it like one last look. But, I can see uh, that. <laughs> I can see that. And then as far as finding a designer, did you get a recommendation from someone or did you hop on Upwork and look for someone who was experienced in designing books for Amazon? Well, it, it turned out that my daughter found somebody because she was she was uh, planning to to write a book, and she found somebody whose design that she really liked, and I liked what he did for her. Oh, very good. And then I talked to him, and uh, you know, I, we've never met him, and then he just he just did everything for it. He had a lot of experience, great designs, and the key thing for me was that he did the interior design. Um, because there's a lot of specifications that you have to meet to put it up on Amazon. And he takes care of, of all of that. You can go like, oh, I kind of like it to have this look and this kind of font and that sort of thing. And then he comes back and you go like, yeah, that's, that's, that's great. And you know? does he help you pick a font that's suitable for, because I'm assuming this book then people can download as a PDF where they can read on their Kindle and are there different delivery yep. methods? So you have to pick something that's universal. Oh, here's what you're going to love. So it, it's a Kindle and we conceived of it as a Kindle book. But when you do the Kindle Direct, 
they do a print on demand paperback. Oh, I was going to ask you that so too. People, do they print people it? People order that. There's huh. like a five day delay for for people to get the print version, but it looks totally awesome. The book looks totally awesome. That's so cool. Um, but and we don't we don't do anything. You know, for oh. you know, on the, on on actually creating the book, that's all done by Amazon, um, and they ship it out, of course. And you know, so it's super smooth process. Uh, that's great. So so we like that. Now to go back to the font thing, that he had a portfolio of work that he he done. So you can kind of go, hey, I liked these covers that you did thinking these colors and here's the feel I kind of want. And he comes back pretty quickly with, with a couple of ideas and we liked them, made just a few little tweaks. And on the inside, he has some examples of books he's done. You go like, Oh, I, I like the approach you took and you know, the blah, blah, blah book. And so then he does that. And um, can, would you share with us just a ballpark of what it costs to have someone design your book and get it Amazon ready for you? $750. Huh, no kidding. That's amazing. Allison, hold it up for me again. And then what I want listeners to do is go look on Amazon. It's Make LinkedIn Work For You, which is what we're here to talk about, the book. Make LinkedIn Work For You, a practical handbook for lawyers and other legal professionals. Really nice cover, super simple. I mean, there's not much going on there, but it works. I think it's great. Yeah. Looks there's pretty. Some, there's, there's some imagery, like, you know, in the background, like in a lighter color that I, I don't see is showing up on when, when she's holding up. But That's there's cool. A, there's a design on it. But yeah, it was pretty much what we wanted. Damn, I'm going to think of a book I want to write and do that just so I can be an author. <laughs> I've always wanted to be an author, guys. Um, yeah, like, but, how, how can I do a book but, without writing it? But for that problem <laughs> where I said, I don't read and I don't write, but I sure like to talk and I really listen. <laughs> well, that's okay. You can write a book that way because you I can could. just eat, talk and then have it transcribed or yeah. talk to somebody else and have them write it. I really need to work on that. I just need a topic. If anybody has an idea out there, send it to me. So um, let me ask you something. Let's start with, let's start talking about some of the tips and tricks that come out of the book, which um, like I said, lawyers ask me a lot about LinkedIn and I'm always like, I mean, yeah, but let's get some good news and some good tips going. Let's start with what I think is really the most critical part and that's making sure your profile looks good, sounds good. Do I want my profile to say, Henry Herman, real estate lawyer, or should it be a little more inviting than that? I think, first of all, what you're calling out there is is the headline. And that's one of the most important pieces, I think, of your, of your profile, because it follows you all around LinkedIn. So even if someone's not actually looking at your profile, but you show up in search results, or they see you in a group or something, you know, that you write in your as a network update, they're going to see your name and your and your headline and your picture. I mean, those three things they're going to see everywhere. And so you want to make sure that when somebody sees that headline, that they know exactly who you are and what you do. And you want it to create kind of a curiosity in the person so that they'll say, oh, I want to learn more about that person. And so that they'll click through to actually read the rest of your profile, right? So you know, one of the first mistakes I think lawyers make with their headline is not saying that they're a lawyer, uh, <laughs> you know, like the, it'll say, it say partner and it could be, that could be anything, right? <laughs> you know, or so even the, even if they say partner in the name of their firm, th- it could be an accounting firm. They could be, you know, of course. so a lot of times you don't even know that they're a lawyer. So then you want to go a step further and say what kind of lawyer you are, but maybe you want to include something in there like what kinds of clients you represent. Or, you know, some other things that make you stand out from other people who who do what you do. How many characters do you get? I believe the headline is 120 characters. Okay. There's more room than you think, but it's not very much. Okay. You can run it out really quickly. So it's not a short bio. It's a good description of what you do. It's a headline. Because I see a lot where it's it looks to me like some I can always tell when someone's gone to a LinkedIn training because it'll say something like small business attorney helping barbershops, nail salons and tattoo parlors. So it'll be, you know, pretty specific. And I know that that's someone, you know, who read your book, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you can tell that. So I sometimes use this example of, because this partner at XYZ Law Firm, to me, is just a killer. You know, I mean, it just, I, I, 
I don't if you look through like a list of people on their headlines, you go, I, I don't even know why somebody would do that. It also tends to be really interior focused, you know, like head of, you know, blah, 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 right. department, you know, that sort of thing. Whereas I kind of like this, if you can squeeze it in there, I'm, I think of this three step approach. And so say that I'm a biotech lawyer just to choose an example out of thin air. And I, if you say I'm partner of XYZ law firm as a biotech lawyer, it doesn't tell anybody anything. But if I say lawyer who helps biotech startup companies launch new products, semicolon, former chair of state biotech association, semicolon, craft beer brewer, <laughs> uh, then if I'm in the biotech world, I'm going, hey, that's one of my people. You that know? looks cool, <laughs> right? Gosh, well, you guys made me go look at mine while we were talking about it. And mine's pretty lame, so I need to fix it. Mine just says legal technology consultant. Nobody knows what that means. No one. And then, so, so I sometimes say that if you just ask your friends to take a look at your headline and say, "Does this describe what you think it is that I do, or what's unique about?" Oh, that's me? a so good you, way to do so it. So you get some feedback that way. And the other thing is to look at your competition and see yeah. how they're describing themselves. I should so. ask my mom to look at my profile. Mom, <laughs> does this <laughs> imagine? Um, Allison, is one of the services that you provide helping lawyers build a better LinkedIn profile? Yes. Oh, good. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I did. I do. I'll do group trainings. I'll do individual work with individual lawyers on their profiles. Um, some of them I've actually sat down with them and helped write the profile and then handed it off to them. So there's a there's a number of different ways that that I'll work with people. And if, do you mind telling us, giving us ball, ballpark? I always make people tell me prices because I know listeners want to know um, ballpark of what you charge for something like that. Well, some of it depends on how we're going to do it. You know, so some of my clients I'll do ongoing where we do almost like mini training sessions and every training session is like $400 and okay. they're usually like 45 minutes to an hour, which is about as much as people can absorb, sometimes too much. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> um, Tell me about it. <laughs> you know, if I'm writing it for them, which I don't prefer, that's a little more complicated because I usually have to get info from them and I usually have to interview them and then we have to go back and forth with drafts, which is kind of a pain. I'd rather consult and have them write it. Yeah. So then you charge more. Right. Okay. Well, that's good. And that's actually not, I think that's very reasonably priced for something that's so valuable if LinkedIn is going to become a major resource for attorneys, which we'll talk about when we get to our next segment in a few minutes. You know, you, you guys just gave me a great idea for pricing in this new online era where you could say it's $500 for an hour. And for 30 minutes, it's $1,000. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally going to try that with my new business model. That's hilarious. What other things do I need to make sure I, I do with my profile? I've got to have, do I have to have a full resume on there that goes back? Like if you've been, if you're 60 years old, you've got a resume that goes back 40 years. Do people really have to have on there what they did while they were in college? Or do we highlight major points related to our current business goals? Well, you're going to have an approach. And so it, is, so it has implications, right? And so people tend to think of the negative implications of showing your age or going too far back. But you have to make a decision because LinkedIn rewards you for the completeness of your profile. And it helps people find you and, and you can make better connections. So you become more findable uh, and it helps you in certain certain ways. So you're so you're making a judgment about that. And this comes up whether it's you know people uh, you know in the LGBTQ community, people who are religious, political, you know, and a number of things where you you need to make smart decisions about what you put in your profile. But the fact is, the more complete your profile is, the more likely it is for people to find you. And they, they may find just that connection that makes a big difference. So, like, I'm a big advocate of, of hobbies going back further because there are some things that if you're, you know, part of the club – you know, it makes a big difference. So if you were in Boy Scouts and you were an Eagle Scout, when you run into other Eagle Scouts, right. it's a big thing. People who went to like small private schools, or even if you grew up in a small town and yeah. somebody, you run into somebody who has that in common, it's like you're in. Yeah, um, that's, and so, that's so true. So that's what you're you're trying to gauge. And then some of it is very difficult. I mean, don't get me wrong. 
I did a presentation with, you know, L, LGBTQ in LinkedIn. And it is a, a difficult thing to know what to disclose. And then, it, you know, it comes down to this thing like, well, do, if I run into somebody who's bothered by that, do I really want to work with them or work right. for them? You know, so, so it becomes a very complex thing. So I tend to say more is better, but I think keeping it updated is more important. Will you guys go look at my profile picture while we're talking and tell me if you think I should change it? And I mean that, go look at it. Because I picked one that I thought was kind of intriguing, kind of, oh, well, she's got something to say. Um, but I also <laughs> noticed that LinkedIn's pretty pushy, right? First of all, it tells you your profile strength. Do you guys believe in that? Is that a good meter? It says mine's intermediate, which unfortunately for me, I'm okay with intermediate and mediocre. I'm not an overachiever. So this doesn't encourage me to go fill it out. <laughs> Well, I think that I think the completeness thing is important, but obviously the incentive is for LinkedIn to get more of your data. So, you know, it's a trade off like in all things. So LinkedIn gets value of pushing you forward. I do think that having a complete profile does help you in, in a number of ways. What do you think of my picture, Allison? You, I saw uh, you, <laughs> you probably I saw, you saw me laughing. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I, I would change it, at least for your, you might put that somewhere else, even somewhere else on your profile, because you can, uh, you know, attach pictures. You can? But I don't know that that's the one I would want to follow me around, although it probably <laughs> makes people laugh, you know. They might go and say, hey, what are we looking at? But to get back to Dennis's point, yeah, I, the completeness does help you. And I would try to make your profile as complete as you can because LinkedIn kind of rewards you for that in terms of different things that were different doors that kind of open up. You're seen more in search if your profile is complete. And uh -huh. I know there's a whole section in the help that tells you what the advantages are of being complete. And complete is not... You know, even as elaborate as Dennis is saying, it means you have your about section filled out. It usually means you have your current position and I think two previous positions. You know, I think you have to have like five skills listed. It's not onerous to right. get to that point of being what LinkedIn considers all star, which is their most complete. Got it. And it does allow you to put in things like your best posts. You can upload documents, which I'm going to guess are things like articles you've written, blog posts, and then media. So I guess if you've got videos or maybe you were interviewed on TV or something, you would be able to put it there. And then of course, websites. So right, you can create a pretty complete profile of your experience and who you were and who you are by just going through all this. It's got add a profile section about featured background skills, accomplishments, additional information, supported languages. So very cool. Yeah, the, the media links are great because so if you're, you know, like you could link to to a podcast or you could link to a podcast that you were interviewed on or if there was a video done of a presentation you did or your slides, yeah. all those sorts of things just become like, and they they add some extra graphic interest as well to somebody who sees your profile. Okay, well, great. Before we take a break, any other last minute tips we've got to make sure and know about when it comes to filling out our profile? Don't be afraid to, uh, to schedule time to update it on a regular basis, like every quarter or something like that. And because what a lot of people do is they, they get, you're real comfortable in your job. And so you don't update what you've done at your current job. And then all of a sudden do you decide you have to leave or get a new job. And then you're, you're scurrying to come up with what it is that you've you've done that's important. Unless you update on a on a regular basis, you actually might be more likely to be contacted by a, a recruiter or or something because your your information is up to date. And then I do believe in like a nice current professional photo. So um, you don't like my picture either? Um, I don't know. I just I just remember like one of my old law firms that um, it just seemed, and that was a while back, don't get me wrong, but I'm, I don't know if it's going to be all that different today, but it's, it's like all the photos were like black and white and the people look 10 to 20 years younger than they actually were. You, you want to avoid that because one of the useful things about LinkedIn is when you bring it into l the real world, like you're going to have lunch or coffee with somebody, you can go to their LinkedIn profile and see their picture. And so when you, you see them in the restaurant, you, to the extent we're allowed to go to restaurants ever again, <laughs> that you're, you would be able to say hello like you knew them. Yeah. No, I love that. Well, great. Let's take a quick break. Listen to a couple messages from some sponsors. And when we come back, we're going to talk about connections. I have so many questions. So we'll be right back. 
If you're missing calls, appointments, and potential clients, it's time to work with Nexa Professional. More than just an answering service, Nexa's virtual receptionists are available 24 seven to schedule appointments, qualify leads, respond to emails, integrate with your firm software, and much more. Nexa ensures your clients have the experience they deserve. Give them a call at 800-267-9371 or visit them at nexa.com forward slash podcast for a special offer. Law Clerk is where attorneys go to hire freelance lawyers. Whether you need a research memo or a complicated appellate brief, our network of freelance lawyers have every level of experience and expertise. Signing up is free and there are no monthly fees. Only pay the flat fee price you said. Use rebate code NEWSOLO to get a $100 Amazon gift card when you complete your next project. Learn more at lawclerk.legal. All right, we're back. I'm on the line with Dennis Kennedy and Allison Shields, my LinkedIn for Lawyers gurus. They've got a new book out called Make LinkedIn Work for You. You can get it on Amazon, and I hope that you do run out and get it. I wanted to ask you guys about connections. Do you accept connections from people you don't actually know, Dennis? Yeah, but that's because I'm a public, (laughs) kind of a public figure, and I've written about LinkedIn and stuff, so I've always done that. Also, I'm running some science experiments on LinkedIn (laughs) and connections, so I'm I err on the side of quantity, but I do, I do use a couple of tests that I use. So usually the shared connections, number of shared connections, that there's some kind of plausible link. You know, some things. Obviously, if somebody asks to connect to me and they have zero or one connection. And I don't, and they're like a social media advisor or something like right. that. Then, then I'm I'm not going to connect to that. Typically, I won't connect to like people who who seem really young. So you know, that's just my. Th- and I don't typically like to connect to to law students who I don't know them already. So there would be a, a number of things. But yeah, I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty open about it. But I think it's very different. You know, being a an older white male, frankly on accepting connections from people you don't know than it is probably for almost every other category. (laughs) You guys are a special category. (laughs) What about you, Allison? How do you um, monitor and accept or deny connection requests? I will connect to people that I don't know, but not as frequently as Dennis does. And I have some, some of those same tests, but I maybe take it a little bit further you know, one of my kind of tests is if I don't already know the person, did they take the time to personalize their invitation to me? Or did they just send me the the stock LinkedIn invite? And I know that sometimes that's harder to personalize when you're using the mobile app. So, you know, there are reasons maybe why people are doing that. But that always takes it a step further for me. So if somebody is taking the time to personalize the invitation to talk about what they saw that made them want to connect with me or why we might be good for one another or how we might be able to do business together, that person is going to have a much better chance of of getting their uh, connection request accepted from me. But I, there are people that if I look at their profile or I see what they're doing on LinkedIn, and I think that they make sense for me to connect with, even if I don't know them, I will connect with them. So I just don't go as far as Dennis. I'm not quite as open. And one of the reasons is I like to the extent that I can for my network to be not just helpful to me, but also helpful to other people in my network. So Adriana, if you were looking at my LinkedIn and you saw that I was connected to Dennis and you said, hey, you know, can you introduce me to Dennis Kennedy or what do you know about Dennis Kennedy? And that's happened to me on occasion where somebody has said, hey, see, you're connected to this person on LinkedIn. I, I'm either thinking about hiring them. What do you know about them? Or, you know, I'm thinking about doing business with them. What do you know about them? Or how can you introduce me to them? And if I am connected to all these people that I have no real connection to, that's much harder for me to do. Your network is diluted if, if that happens. How much time a day do you guys spend on LinkedIn? And I mean that from a professional perspective, not because you wrote a book about it, but how I never go in there. I think I have 160 connections sitting there waiting for me to accept or deny because I just don't go in there that much. But do you all actually spend time in there? And do you get requests like that a lot, Allison? Do you like tell me about the power of the connections? I mean, I do I do get requests like that on a fairly regular basis. Huh. I would say not not all the time, 
But I would say probably on average, once a month or once every other month, I'll get somebody that will ask me something about somebody that I'm connected to on LinkedIn. Oh. And that may be because they know that I wrote a book about it and, and so forth. And so they figure my, you know, I'm, I may be using it differently than, than they're using it. Mm-hmm. In terms of how much time I spend, there are some days that I, I don't hop on there at all. And there are some days that I spend significantly more time. And that's in part just because of the way your schedule is or what have you, but I try to schedule things out also. So some of my time that I'm spending on LinkedIn is really spent on other platforms and then I'm scheduling out posts, you know, whether that be using Hootsuite or I'm on the web and I find an article that's interesting and I, I, you know, I put it into Buffer to post tomorrow or I've written a bunch of blog posts and and I'm using a service to then push those blog posts out to LinkedIn and to other social media. So it may look like I'm physically spending more time on LinkedIn than I am. Than you really are. Yeah, Um, Yeah. But I do try to look at it. I do try to spend some time there at least every week. That may be broken up into a couple different times during the week or it may be just, I haven't done it this week. I better sit down and do some stuff on LinkedIn. What about you, Dennis? What, what do you use? What are you doing in there all day long? Well, I probably spend, when you go to time, I probably spend a lot less time than, than people would expect. And so for me, there's, there's two things I do that I think are really important. I have a reminder for myself to just take a look at my LinkedIn profile once a month. And then I also have scheduled every three months to go out to think about connecting videos, audios, and updating mm the site. I also do some, what I call AB testing, you know, where I might- A lot of testing out of you, Dennis. Yeah. Like a little bit of, uh, yeah, I seem to be going more into science mode yeah. lately. You know, so I, I want to say like, I, if I say this in the, in my headline, does that, does that make a difference? That sort of thing. And oh. then when I do updates, it's pretty easy. You just go in there and see how many views, you know, the replies, stuff like that. And then I would say what's going to typically pull me is when I get an alert that somebody's messaged me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I have yeah. a number of people. It's one of those weird things. Like I have some people who instant message me in LinkedIn. I have some people who instant message me in Twitter, some in Slack, some in, you know, like every everywhere you can think of. But LinkedIn is one place. And I would say lately, most of the inquiries I get about speaking come through LinkedIn. Really? That's what I would say. And there are also some groups that I'm involved in. And then I also, I use LinkedIn because my audience gets out so I can amplify other, you know, my friends things. So like if you said, you know, you wanted to get like a bump, you know, more attention for your podcast or for your new book, for example. <gasps> for my new then, business plan. Yeah, then if I, if I did an update about that on LinkedIn, it's likely to get let's say several thousand views and that that was that an offer help. right Dennis yeah that will I... help you am- amplify of course I'm yeah, you're as my you know, biggest fan the original and still honorary <laughs> president of, uh, of your fan club so uh, the, uh, yeah so I love that. so that's how I do it so I, I would say it's one of those things where um, as Allison said I think that some people th- say like wow you're spending all your time on LinkedIn but it's actually compared yeah. to like a time suck like Twitter. It's, it's very small, you know. Talk about so. a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> do you recommend that people go in and remove connections that are? So here's one thing I do, which is I, I try very hard to keep my connections very legal specific because I don't care about anyone who's not legal. So if there's a person who worked in legal, but now they're working for an insurance company or they've left legal, I unfriend them on LinkedIn. Should I do that? I would say no. It's like, the, I think that the value of, what I've learned about LinkedIn over the years is the value of weak, what they call weak connections. So if you think about who refers you business and, you know, where things, leads come to you, you would say in the real world, you would go like, wow, it's it's not from, it's not usually from the people you would expect. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of things. It's like connections of connections, people you ran into a long time ago, somebody you did a talk for, you know, 10 years ago even. So I like to keep people in there and I I generally don't weed people out. People sort of weed themselves out. And there's also a big benefit to leaving people in right now in the COVID era Uh. is that as people get laid off, lose their jobs, make changes, that you're going to lose connection with them. Whereas if you're connected to them on LinkedIn, they're going to update their profile and stuff. And then you kind of are able to keep in touch with them. So I err on that. I'm like a quantity person more than a quality. I mean, I do both. And 
Allison sometimes says that I have this reality distortion effect because because I do have my own audience, right? So that yeah. if I send an invitation to somebody, they're probably more likely to connect with me than if if it's, you know, just you know, the average lawyer sending it out to somebody. Yeah. I, I take that into account. But I like, I'm just really intrigued by the notion that weak connections, because I think that reflects what happens in the real world. You know, it's like yeah. somebody you met, even somebody you run into the grocery store, that almost that kind of thing. But on, if you keep kind of narrowing it down in LinkedIn, you're just, you're in the same echo chamber and you're not getting, you know, anything fresh into it. Also, if you're talking about somebody who was in in your target market, right, somebody who was in legal and then has now left to do something else, they probably still have connections in legal. So, you know, yeah, by cutting true. them off, you're potentially cutting off their connections that might ultimately become, you know, clients or customers or referral sources or whatever. What else do we need to know about connections from Make LinkedIn Work For You? Um, sort of my big thing is that LinkedIn has been around for pretty close, open to the public for, I think in another week or so, for 17 years. Wow. So they've been working with this data for a long time and they have all their algorithms and they analyze the way that networks work. So in LinkedIn, you'll see something like this area called You May Know, and it will make suggestions of people that you mm-hmm. may know or should be connected to. I've done a lot of, uh, here I go experimenting again, but I did a lot of experimenting <laughs> in that that area just to see how effective that algorithm is. And it actually is really interesting who it's suggesting. That's one area to, to play with. Then I also think there are times, like when I moved from St. Louis to Michigan, I really wanted to develop a Michigan LinkedIn network really quickly. So I did a lot of outreach and invitation. And so I think that sometimes when you're moving locations or say you're changing a practice area or opening a new business, then you may do add a lot of connections in a short period of time. And there are some really good techniques to do that. We're going to take a quick break, listen to a couple more messages, and then I'm going to come back and ask you about what do I do with LinkedIn? Do I participate or sit on the sidelines? I have a feeling I know what you two are going to tell me, but we'll be right back. Artificial intelligence won't outpace lawyers anytime soon. But lawyers who use AI are already outpacing lawyers who do not. With Ross Intelligence, lawyers conducting legal research leverage AI to get to the heart of legal issues fast. Ask a question on the Ross Legal Research platform, and Ross will return on Point Case Law. Go to rossintelligence.com today and get a 14-day free trial. Use promo code LEGALTALK for 10% off. The legal industry is undergoing a fundamental transformation, and the Daily Matters podcast is here to give you a competitive edge. In Daily Matters, Clio CEO Jack Newton interviews prominent legal experts to explore how solo and small firm lawyers can succeed in the current economic environment. To listen, visit clio.com forward slash daily or subscribe to Daily Matters wherever you get your podcasts. All right, we're back. We're with uh, Dennis Kennedy and Allison Shields, two of my favorite people on the planet, talking to us about LinkedIn, giving us a lot of good ideas and suggestions, and basically doing a free consultation for me on my LinkedIn profile. But um, I think everyone should go look at my picture and tell me if you think I should change it or leave it. We should do an A-B test. No, that's not an A-B test. It's just a vote. Just a vote. I'm I'm in favor of changing it. (laughs) Wow, that's two. (laughs) Tell me about what are are your recommendations for participation? So there are some of us who literally never post anything. And we just read a lot. So I I think for me, LinkedIn is a really powerful and interesting place for me to get information about the legal profession. I I think some of the best articles and posts and the the most useful information I ever find is through LinkedIn. So I use it when I find the time to get in there. I, I do spend a lot of time really more than anything just reading stuff, not necessarily looking at other people or trying to connect with them. Tell us about participation. The first thing that come, came to mind for me, Adriana, when you were just talking about how you use LinkedIn and the fact that you don't really post very much, but you read and you find really great articles that are relevant to not only you, but really they're relevant to your target audience too. They're about the legal profession. So well, I think one of the biggest misconceptions about participating on LinkedIn is that you have to be a content creator and create your own stuff and write your own things Mm. all the time. That's not necessarily true. You can be a very effective participant on LinkedIn by just sharing other people's content or liking or 
commenting on that content. So when you see a really great article, if you comment on it or if you reach out to the person that wrote it and potentially maybe connect with them or the person that shared it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the person that wrote it. Um, you're also building your network and your reputation that way. You know, as somebody who says, well, Adriana knows where to go and who to follow to get the best information for lawyers. So, so I'm going to follow her and I'm going to watch what what she's doing. So it doesn't have to be your own created content in order to participate, but you are a content creator. I mean, you've got a podcast, so th those things are easy for you. Oh. Uh, I should to put share. these on there. <laughs> <laughs> I really should. Here's, Here's an, an idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking for content, guys. Talk about low hanging fruit. <laughs> Seriously, I am the I'm the worst social media -er ever. I don't know where people find the time. I just have to say that I don't know. And my friends are some of the guiltiest parties between all the platforms. I, I just don't know. I never have time. What other questions do you typically get from lawyers? And I think that's really important, Allison, because that's something I get all the time is I don't have time to write things. But what you're suggesting is you can become an influencer of sorts without having to create content, just as long as you're participating, reacting, interacting. What do you think about when it says Dennis Kennedy is celebrating his two years at University of Michigan? Uh, well, that, if it said two years, it'd probably be Michigan State. But. Okay. And then they have the, the corny canned responses. It says, congrats. Are we pro that or let's take a moment to write something unique and genuine? I'm totally thumbs up on that because it's a touch. And, you know, so if it's somebody you know, you haven't talked to her for a while, and a lot of those people, you just say, congrats on the new role, like the canned response, and they'll send you something back. I guess it's just reminding people that you're out there. Yeah, it's just it's just a touch. And right, that makes sense. So I'm in favor of that. I don't know about you, Allison. I'm not like a big birthday person, but some people do that. I kind of ignore the birthdays on LinkedIn. I mean, I'm all for the birthdays on Facebook, but that that me too talks about how the difference in the way I use those two different platforms. I don't know that I'd be offended if somebody wished me a happy birthday on LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> I but didn't. I disconnect from It's not something I usually do. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Send them a nasty email. Yeah. yeah. I, how dare you wish how me? How dare you <laughs> on LinkedIn? Don't you know this for Facebook? Your recipes go on Facebook, lady. Unless, no, of course, you're a personal chef. Well, that's so true, unless you're a personal chef and you're trying to get people who want you to cook for them in their homes. I would like that, right? Here's my, I, I can either make this for you or you can make it yourself. I'd probably immediately hire them. It's sort of more effective than that these days. And not that many people use it as uh, this tagging thing. So if you type the ad symbol and start to type somebody's name, LinkedIn will suggest the person that you're talking about. And then you can click on that and we'll put their name into your post. And then they get specifically notified of that. So I was thinking about, you know, your thing, because you, if you're reading the news feed, let's say daily or regularly, that you could do great things with liked, likes and comments and shares. I mean, it'd be amazing what you could do. And then you, you have your 160 people. So if you put something out, that is your audience. It's so tiny. But if, you, if you're adding to your connections and, and you're tagging specific people that you want to see this, then look how much your reach has extended. One thing I wish I had more time to do is, and which is I think what you're, one of the quick ways you're suggesting of connecting with people and just touching them and reminding them that you're out there is I read these great articles and I think, oh, I know somebody who would like that. And I never, I just don't have, the, I don't take the time, but you're right. If I found a great article on such and such, I should just, and you don't have to pub, post everything publicly. You can certainly share things privately yep. if you'd like, but then there's something to be said about also just posting that publicly, right? Because one, it's a touch point. Two, you're tagging someone else. And three, you've got something on your feed all of a sudden, and maybe someone else would jump in and interact. Right. And then say that there's somebody you just really like what they're writing or what they're doing. And you start to do this thing where you're liking their stuff and you're sharing their stuff and they they may notice you. And then if you're in one of the premium accounts, you can see that they looked at your profile and then you you send them an invitation to connect and 
they're going to be connected with you. And then all of a sudden that you're connected with somebody who's like a leading figure in the field, you know, and, and it just happens sort of organically online. It's just kind of a cool phenomenon. And you said something that made me think of something else too. In order to see who has seen or looked at your profile, you have to have your something turned on, right? Yeah. So you'll get in the in a free account, you'll get limited information, but you you can't be using LinkedIn anonymously. You have to have it turned on so that people can see who you are. You know, so there's different ways to use LinkedIn and and there are sometimes reasons but I think for a, a limited amount of time that you might set yourself to anonymous. So for example, if you're a lawyer and you're using LinkedIn to, to look things up for a case, you might want to put that as anonymous so that the other party or whoever it is doesn't see that you're looking at their profile. But LinkedIn will not give you more access than you allow other people if that makes sense. So, that's what it was. That's what yeah. I was thinking by turning. So explain that to us just a little bit. So you have in in the settings, you can set how you want other people to see you when you're looking at different things. You can be completely anonymous. And I don't remember what they call the one in the middle, Dennis. I don't know if you can remember off the top of yeah, your head. I, for, I forget what the, the name of that is. Yeah, creepy, we just started, we just creepy say, level two. No, <laughs> level just, so what people would see is it would say something like a, a legal technology consultant looked at your so it's this, you know, kind of kind of weird thing. But yeah, as you up the level, then you can you can start to see. It. So to the extent you're allowing people to look at your information, which is to me the whole point of, right. of LinkedIn, that some some people say I'm worried about my privacy on LinkedIn. I'm going like, well, it's a, it's like a business networking tool. Like, and you're you're in control of what you're in control of what you put out there. It's like the classic thing, you know. You always say. That lawyers always like to do hide in the closet marketing, like my work with <laughs> myself, you know, that sort of thing. So like on LinkedIn, I'm going to be totally private. Nobody can see anything about me. And then they'll say, I just don't get any benefit from LinkedIn. I don't, you know, I don't understand. I don't know why. <laughs> um, let me ask you a couple random but sort of rapid fire questions. Should I pay for LinkedIn premium? Yes. Two cases. So one is if I'm Actively looking for a job, the job looker, whatever I call it, the job looker account, whatever seeker. it's called. Job seeker. Job seeker. $30 a month. You can turn it on and then you can terminate it whenever you want, but it gives you a lot of benefits. If you're still in your current job, it will let recruiters see that you're looking for a job and, uh, and certain other people, but it won't let like your employer see it and other people who aren't in the right category. So they've done a good job of that. It lets you see more of the people, I mean, maybe even all the people who've looked at your profile in the last month, which will tell you whether people that you've sent resumes to are looking uh, at oh, you more deeply. Okay. Uh -huh. And it allows you to do some other things. The sales pro account, once you do it as a small business owner, you're just going to get hooked because it's <laughs> it's like eighty dollars a month, you know, which is a, a you know a decent amount of money. But it yeah, allows it you to do just amazing, amazingly granular search, reach out to people who you aren't directly connected to in different ways. And uh, I, you know, in the this pandemic day, I looked at the sales pro and said, "Geez, that's a thousand dollars a year I could save." just by turning that off. And I said, well, you know, I'm going to launch some new things. It's like you're launching your new business. I, I'm like, no, it's like too valuable to me that I can like segment people, you know, by different categories, by job position, all those sorts of things, and then, then work on them. But Dennis, I think that your experience is maybe atypical because you are already a heavy LinkedIn user. So, you know, I always say to people, look, I mean, one of the good things, at least so far with these LinkedIn premium accounts is you could turn them on and off. So it's not like you're, you have to spend the whole thousand dollars for the year. You can decide, well, I'm going to try it out. And if I, if I'm not really using it, I can turn it off. But a lot of the lawyers, at least that I talk to are not even using a, a fraction of the capacity of what's there in the free account. For somebody like that to jump them into a premium account, I don't know if it would be worth it. I think they have to get their hands into LinkedIn and start using it more and then maybe decide to try out the premium account. Because if you never open up LinkedIn, it doesn't matter what kind of account you have, you're not using it. <laughs> Well, and I'm a good example of that person. But I think if you're starting out something, especially, or you're launching a new marketing thing, new practice group, practice area, you could, the, just the fact that 
LinkedIn is going to give you a way to say, give me a list of all the C-level executives who identify as biotech companies in my state or the surrounding couple of states and give me that list and tell me like how they're connected to me. Are they first, second, third degree connections? And give me some more information like that. That's really powerful. It's hard to get that information when you're, when you're launching like a new sales effort. But I like what Allison is suggesting, which you can turn it on and off, right? So, yeah. Oh, yeah, you, and based on your needs, that's great. Next question yeah, get, for you. Get the job, turn it off. That makes sense. <laughs> I mean, come on, it's the smart thing to do. It's the, it's the financially responsible thing to do. Tell me real quick, if you don't mind, a couple more questions, because I know we're going long. But I, as we talk more, I could ask a million more questions. You guys are going to have to come back. And w- here's what we'll do. I will ask listeners to email in questions that they've thought of, because I've got like 10 more, but I'm just going to ask you a couple more and then we'll have you guys back. <laughs> and and we, nobody will need to buy the book at that point. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We won't no, give away a, there all There is the so much in the book. It's so unbelievable. Much. Um, what about business LinkedIn pages? So if you're a lawyer and you're a solo, do you need the business page? So, you know, that's a really interesting question. And it, you know, maybe this is a subject for a, a science experiment, Dennis. Oh, I got somebody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I think there is value to having it for a number of reasons. One seems kind of silly, but I think it makes you look more professional. Uh, mm-hmm. So if you, especially if you have a, a logo and it's attached to your company page, it's going to show on your uh, LinkedIn profile and then people can click from your profile directly over to the company page. And if you're a small firm or if you're in a small firm, I think it's even more important to have a business page or what they call on LinkedIn a company page because everybody who works for that business is then attached to that page. So, yeah. you know, one of the utilities of using the company pages from a user perspective is that I can go and see who are all of the people that are working for the Dennis Kennedy idea propulsion lab. And I can see who's connected to that page. And I, and I can also see how I'm connected to them. Dennis, how many people are currently connected to the company <laughs> propulsion page? I don't know. It's like 30 or so, but I just, I just launched it. And I'm out, the experiment I'm doing is with showcase pages, which are a new thing. Oh. So off your company page, you can do these showcase pages. So say that you're starting this new line of business that you're going to start. You could actually do a separate showcase page that highlights just that. So people have like multiple practice areas. It gives you that. And then to me, the the great benefit of the LinkedIn company pages and the like is that LinkedIn has Google juice like nobody's business, right? So that if you do a search on yourself, that LinkedIn company page is likely to be probably the top result, maybe, but certainly the top three. Oh, wow. Um, That's so powerful. Yeah. Okay, we're going to come back and talk about that next time you guys come see me. Two more quick questions. What about groups? Should we be joining groups? So I think groups is one of the most powerful tools within LinkedIn. And, And I think at least anecdotally for the people that I've spoken to, who the lawyers who have gotten business through LinkedIn, a lot of it is as a result of being a participant in groups. I will say a lot of people poo-poo the LinkedIn groups and they say they're not really useful and there's a lot of spam and or the groups are just not good. Nobody's doing anything in them. But, I, you know, the way I look at it is it's just like real life. Some groups you join yeah. and they're, you know, it's a whole bunch of people who just want to run around and hand out their business card and they're not really in, right. interested in having a conversation or interacting or providing value. And it's the same thing on LinkedIn. So, you, you know, it can be hit or miss and you got to find the groups that make sense. But uh, look, if you've got a, a group of people who are all in one place and they're all in your target market, don't you want to be there? I mean, yes. I find a lot of value in, in the groups for that reason. And, and to Things that we were talking about sharing, you know, you can share to some extent, obviously, to your own network by posting to your, you know, your own profile. But oftentimes the groups have a lot more people in them than you have connections. So when you post in a group, a lot of times your posts have more reach than they Mm. would by just posting them on your own page. So those are a couple of the reasons why I think they're useful. Great tips. And you can also, you not only can, and I'll just say this, but we don't have to talk about it, but you not only can join groups and by the way, leave them, like you said, if they aren't working for you, but there's also hashtags just like on 
Twitter and on Facebook of topics of interest. So I follow legal technology, legal marketing, trial practice hashtags, just again, to keep an eye on the profession. And when something interesting goes by, you know, I, I'm alerted of it and maybe I'll share it with people who I think would be interested this point moving forward. The last thing I want to ask you is about advertising. Should a lawyer advertise on LinkedIn, their legal services? Can they? Should they? I'm really, I haven't, I have not done LinkedIn advertising, but it's really intriguing as, as a way to go because I don't think it's very expensive. It's, a, it's not. again, another place where you can test things pretty inexpensively, right? So you could say, hey, we're thinking of starting this new COVID-19 practice group and should we call it a pandemic group? Should we call it COVID-19? Should we call it something else? And you could, you could do these ads and just track to see yeah. Like what response that you get. So there's some things there. Anecdotally, I think people have found some success with it. And I think it's fairly easy to set up and, and use if you're familiar with the ad services. But I think if you're not familiar with the ad services, like the pricing and setting limits on your spend and all that stuff can be a little confusing. I've done it. It's been a, a minute now just to try and sell some webinars on Office and stuff like that. And both LinkedIn and Facebook were very affordable, really easy to figure out how to do. And the reach and response is, is very high because of all the creepy data they have. <laughs> <laughs> they can help you reach the right people. So that's a did you get really, did you get registrants from it though? Yeah, I sure did. Yeah. Wow. Oh. And mm. when I launch my new business angle, I'm going to try Showcase. it again. But first, Showcase. I'm going to hire Allison to help me with my LinkedIn profile. <laughs> 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 you guys are the best. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. And I really do want to encourage everyone to go pick up the book on Amazon. Make LinkedIn. Work for you by Allison and Dennis. Super and affordable. Super. Oh yeah, how much is price. it? Oh, good questions. Because I have two books out, so I forget oh, the price. Yeah, all these so, books. Allison, do you remember what the? <laughs> I the don't book, remember. The book <laughs> I'm gonna go look. I like to be it's like Leo Laporte. Bucks. I like to be like Leo Laporte that gets um, on this. <laughs> yeah, the paperback's while under twenty five dollars because yeah. uh, you know, in as you know, with certain other legal publishers, the prices of books are are super duper high. So that They're was super, super thing. stupid is what they are. I mean, not the yeah, books, yeah. the content is great. The price is stupid. Okay. So it's 24 87 for the paperback. And then I'm sure, Oh, here we go. Ooh, Should if be. you have, but wait, if you have Kindle unlimited, it's $0. So yes. all of you listeners yeah. right now who have Kindle unlimited, you hop on that. And then otherwise it's 14 99 on the Kindle and $25 on the paperback, which is super reasonable. And you know what I find I do all the time. I get a lot of books on audible or on Kindle, but then I buy the hardback or the, right. uh, the actual book because either I didn't catch a word or a name or I want to go back. So maybe, you know, that's another option is you can always do both. Yeah, because that's some people use that that uh, the Kindle Unlimited as a way to test out books that they they eventually buy. So yeah, no, that's there's so some some benefits, but it's it's everything is in Kindle. So that's the uh, if I can use the word experiment, that's the experiment we're trying here. I love it. Well, congratulations, you guys. I'm sure it's great because I have your original LinkedIn for lawyers from the ABA. Somewhere in some one of my many, many houses, that book is sitting somewhere. Now I'm pretty sure Dennis Kennedy signed it. <laughs> Ooh, I wonder what I could get for it on eBay. Probably uh, less than the cover price. <laughs> Colleen would buy it from me. It's a Dennis Kennedy original. Um, Dennis, tell everybody how they can find friend and follow you and connect with you on LinkedIn before I let you go. So I'm always some version of Dennis Kennedy, which means www.denniskennedy.com, which means at Dennis Kennedy on Twitter. And I think that you can, I'm, I'm super easy to find on LinkedIn. That's the search. I connect to people. It's always, so if you do a personal message that said, I loved hearing you on the podcast, <laughs> it's almost guaranteed that I would connect with you. Your uh, podcast or mine? Either of them, but okay. uh, the uh, I don't want to hurt Tom's feelings on this. Oh, he's know. so sensitive too. And uh, <laughs> and so that's that's the 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 best way to do that. I just don't. I always tell people I, I it's pretty rare I connect with anyone on Facebook. I use that for family and friends. So excellent. What about you, Allison? How can people find friend, follow, and hire you? Uh, well, my website is lawyermeltdown.com. <laughs> 
<laughs> and the blog is Legal Ease, which is E A S E Consulting dot com. I have a business page on on LinkedIn for Legal Ease Consulting, and on on Facebook also. On Twitter, I am at Allison Shields, and that's Allison with two L's. And your last name is spelled S H I E L D S, like yes. Shields of Gold. Yes, although it will be J O H S. <laughs> We just have to do all the work to get it changed. Oh, wow. That sounds like a pain. There are a couple of articles coming out of this where Allison will describe how easy or not easy it is to change your name in social media. Across the board sounds crazy. Well, thanks again, you guys. Really appreciate your time and hope to have you back because I have more questions. And again, I'm going to ask our listeners to email in to new solo at legaltalknetwork.com. I get all those messages. If you have any questions for Allison and Dennis that we can have them come back and answer for us, that'd be really fun. If you have recommendations or suggestions for future episodes or topics that you'd like to see covered, you can always send them in that way. Thank you for listening to New Solo on the Legal Talk Network. If you like what you've heard today, I would love for you to subscribe, five-star ratings, and give us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. And remember, you're not alone. You're New Solo. Thanks for listening to New Solo with host Adriana Linares. Tune in again to learn more about how to successfully run your new practice solo here on Legal Talk Network. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of, nor are they endorsed by, Legal Talk Network, its officers, directors, employees, agents, representatives, shareholders, and subsidiaries. None of the content should be considered legal advice. As always, consult a lawyer.